my, my job is to somehow make them curious enough or persuade them by hook or crook to get more aware of themselves and where they came from and what they are into and what is already there and just to bring it out. This is what compels me to compel them. And I will do it by whatever means necessary. Welcome to the Black Girls Heal podcast, where we talk about healing our intimacy disorders, unresolved trauma, and building a healthy relationship with first ourselves and then others. Every episode, we will talk about advice you can apply today to break unhealthy patterns and grow in your self-worth. I'm Sheena Lachey, love addiction coach and trauma specialist. Let's begin. Hello, hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Black Girls Heal. I hope that you're doing so well wherever you are, however you are, and that you are feeling loved by those around you because you deserve it. So in today's episode, we are going to be talking about dating post-divorce. So even though I've had a couple of episodes about divorce and some lessons that I've personally learned um, from divorce or going through that process, I have not had an episode that just talked about the dating experience post-divorce. And I've had several people ask for this to be a topic and I was like, oh, okay, I'll I'll, I'll get to it. And then uh, for the workshop this, that there's, the workshop that is this weekend, the Reclaiming Me workshop, some of the women who were filling out their surveys about what they wanted to talk about were saying how they are post-divorce and they are interested in hearing about this. And then also some of the women who are in the members club community um, asked about it as well when suggesting different podcast episodes or things that they want to hear about. And I was like, okay, this is the need. Uh, this is something that over 50% of us is go- are going to experience, at least up until this point in our society statistically. And I know that a good number of y'all are already divorced, are going through a divorce right now. And so I think that this is timely. I think that this is definitely a need of everyone here. And things do, there are different things to keep in mind post-divorce that you don't necessarily experience or think about or consider when you have either been single only and not been in a long-term monogamous committed relationship, or even if you have been in a committed relationship that is long-term the legal ramifications, the emotional stress, if there's children involved, and again, the impact of all the legal things that come up and all the things that come into that. You know, the idea that when you get married, you're not planning on getting divorced, right? And some of the grief and everything that may come with that or the embarrassment that may come with some of that and how that may play into your future decisions with dating or avoiding dating, you know, not wanting to make those mistakes again. It's, it's all nuance, but it's also normal and it's and it's common. And so I'm going to talk about some of those things here today and we're going to get into it. And I want to say thank you so much for those of you who have already given love to the new addition to the Black Girls Hill family, which is the Business of Healing podcast. Um, I shared the preview in a, a trailer this past weekend. And so just thank you so much to everyone who's already commented on it, um, who's told me that you've enjoyed it so far. And the Business of Healing podcast is for all of my healers, all of my folks who, whether or not you're a therapreneur, whether or not you are someone who just helps people heal in your everyday life, we're talking about the importance of making sure your business, your beliefs, and your boundaries are all taken care of. So you can go ahead and listen to my intro to the podcast if you haven't caught it already here, or just jump right in and listen to the first episode and the trailer at the Business of Healing podcast. For some reason, an Apple podcast especially, you have to type in the Business of Healing. Um, don't forget the the, or it doesn't come up. And there's a whole bunch of other Business of Healings. Um, business of whatever type podcast. So I don't want those to get lost in the mix. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump on it. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Before we get started, let's take a small break to say thank you to this week's sponsors. So here I'm going to share seven considerations to have when it comes to dating post-divorce. Some of these are going to be tips. Some of these are going to be truly things for you to just keep in mind, some things to expect. 
and maybe a little mixture of some other insights as well. But before I get started, it just came to me as I was about to launch into this list. I want to share something that might be a little bit controversial and that those who have not gone through this may not understand. And that's okay if you don't understand. But for those who need to hear it, I really want to normalize this experience in a way, normalize the experience of going through a divorce and then recovering from a divorce. And the reason why I say I want to normalize it is because I think the population of women, men, and non-binary folks who listen to this podcast, you listen to this podcast because you are actively learning how to show up in relationships and how to unlearn a lot of triggers and traumas that have been normalized for you in your everyday life. So that means that many of us do not wake up until we are later on in our adulthood and to what dysfunction actually looks like because it's been so commonplace for us, or maybe we knew what dysfunction was, but it was something that we readily accepted and just chalked it up as it being life or it being, you know, things that happen in relationships, not knowing that we didn't have another decision right? Um, Or we had outside pressures that made us feel like this is the right way. And it was only been through us healing and, and becoming healthier and learning more about ourselves and what love is and what connection is and what the truth, what true partnership looks like that we woke up and that we made decisions for ourselves that were better. And so I think for, again, the people who listen to this podcast, for many of us, we have we committed to relationships that were not good for us from the beginning, right? We we did again, we didn't see the red flags or it was right in line with our trauma. And so it just looked like it looked normal. It looked like par, um par of the, par for the course. And so unfortunately for some of us, this will be a part of our our healing journey and our path to to reclaim ourselves, to heal ourselves, and to find real love and partnership and do all the things that we thought was normal, right? Like the the normal, you know, conflict that happens and and relearning each other and growing together and growing apart, but to do that in a con- healthy container with another mature, healthy adult, it looks different and it feels different than when um, you're with someone or in a situation that is toxic or abusive um, or just using you as a placeholder and really taking you for granted. You know, we've talked about the concept of married single women or married single mothers, right? So um, I want you to, all that commitment and all that love and all that attention that you have for that person before, I'm so excited that you're listening to this podcast because that means this podcast episode specifically because that means that you are on the journey to starting to hope again. Um, to be open to love again and open to connection again, which is hard one for us, for many of us. Some of us, we are ready for it. You know, exiting that relationship was a source of liberation and through some time by ourselves or sometimes some time realigned with what we actually wanted, we are excited about um, partnering again. And for some of us, it's been very scary. So when I talk about normalizing it, I want to normalize that it's okay for you when you see that you have made a wrong decision, that you get to change your mind at any time. You are not bound to live in suffering and in abuse and in toxic toxicity forever and be forever punished. You know, if anything, that is also a sign of, of many of our traumas, like that when we are doing something bad or when we're undeserving, that we deserve the shit that comes to us, that we deserve the consequences, that we just have to sit there and take it. And no, girl, you deserve blessings and abundance. You deserve the opportunity to grow. You get to des- you deserve the opportunity to step into your highest level version of yourself with full love and care and commitment and generosity so that you can be that vessel of love for other people. You can't do that when you're getting flagellated emotionally, mentally, and sometimes physically by the people in your life. You know, those those things don't go together. And so I I want to normalize that it's okay for you to change your mind. And I also want to normalize the fact that this is so common, right? So I would I would expect that in this podcast that the good majority of people who listen to this podcast have either 
been divorced, you've considered divorce, or you're listening to this podcast to make sure that you don't get into that population, right? That you are um, very much aware. But the truth is, even outside of this podcast, go into any room and count off one, two, one, two, one, two. And every other person, actually more, if we actually like you kept going, you know, after a certain number of people, you add in a number two and three have gone through this and will go through this. And I think what happens with divorce is it causes so much shame. It is, it feels like a very overt form of failure. And depending on what your story is and what's important to you, different people feel may may feel different forms of embarrassment and shame about what they feel like they failed with. You know, I failed with picking the right partner. I failed before the eyes of God and I've made him upset with me. I have failed because I let this person um, take advantage of me and humiliate me. And everybody saw, I, I feel silly because, you know, like there's so many different reasons why people may feel this way. But here's the thing. We all, we all, we all have to live this life and live it fully. And we all have to learn and we all have to grow. And it's not what happens to us. It's the meaning that we make from it. So if you use this experience as evidence of you failing or not being enough, then that's going to be true. That is absolutely going to be your truth. And you're going to continue to find evidence that lives up to that. Or you can take the reframe that I'm offering in that you made a really brave decision. And even if you were not the one that asked for the divorce and you were blindsided by this and, you know, part of this process has been you truly having to heal from your heart being completely shattered and devastated and um, and broken, still, there's still meaning that you get to decide that you can take from this. You can take the meaning that love is not real, um, that there's no point anyways, that all insert gender are horrible people and you can never trust any of them. And on this side of the fence, y'all, I've heard people who are attracted to everybody say that. I've heard people say that about men, that men are all full of shit. And I've had women who love women say that to me, that all women are full of shit. You know, so it really is about your perspective and the mindset that you're coming with. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump on in with these things because like I said, there are seven there are seven and we don't want this to be a 90 minute podcast episode, or at least I don't want it to be. I want to keep it to my 45, 50 minute max that I try to teach in. So the first one is to allow yourself time to heal when we look at dating post-divorce. The first consideration that I'm going to share is for you to allow yourself time to heal. So I kind of already just talked about that, but here's Here's what I want to say about that. Some of us are what I just shared, right? Where this divorce either completely blindsided you or you did you were you were the one who orchestrated it, but it was begrudgingly. It was after it was long it was long suffering. You really fought everything for it. You you tried to negotiate in your mind, you tried to justify, you did all the things. And finally, you were forced to make a decision for your health, maybe for the health of your kids, um, maybe a safety position, maybe, you know, whatever. And so when you're coming from that type of devastation, it is really important to allow yourself the space to grieve. You can go and get rebounds. You can go and say, you know what, I just need to distract myself. Um, But in this place of a brokenness, you're not seeing straight, right? These these momentary pleasures end up not being so pleasurable anymore if you're using them to self-soothe and to self-medicate. You know, um, there's I don't believe there's really anything in this world that's necessarily purely bad, but when we use it to excess and to try to heal a hole or to fill a gap that it wasn't meant to fix, we can take the most benign things and make them addictions, make them tragic, make them unhealthy for us, you know? And so I think that allowing your space, allowing yourself that space to, to feel sad 
and to feel confused and to feel lost and to not having answers and to be angry and to hate people. You know, you don't have to leave this relationship feeling like Mother Teresa um, because especially if you are someone, you're listening to this podcast about dating post-divorce, I'm assuming you're interested in dating. So maybe there are some of you who may be trying to repress your feelings because you are you don't want to be cut off from love. But girl, you got to let the emotions, you have to go through the process. You have to let the, let yourself feel those feelings or they're going to get stuck in your body and they are going to come out. They're going to come out either through stress, they're going to come out through um Lack of trust with potential new people is going to come out through skepticism. It's going to come out through inability to focus or sleep, sadness, anxiety. Like the grief is going to be there. We can't run from our grief, um, unfortunately. <laughs> it will it will show up. And so the best gift that you can give yourself is to let yourself feel what you need to feel and let yourself be a complete mess and mix of emotions. Be super happy and, you know, rejuvenated and like you're on top of the world one minute and the next minute you feel like crap and like there's no point anymore. And then the next moment you're in bliss and then the next moment you are raging and the next moment you thinking that your coworker is cute. And then the next moment, oh God, I can't stand the look of men. You know, like let yourself feel whatever you need to feel and heal. The same advice is for women who are very similar to my position, where when you exited the relationship, you did not feel the grieving around the relationship. You felt some liberation, right? You felt freedom. You felt like doing snow angels in your bed (laughs) because you had it to yourself. Like Even for y'all, or maybe especially for y'all, Allowing yourself time to heal is very important because if that is your experience that you were in a committed um, marital legal partnership with someone um, for any amount of time and you feel that that sense of joy, it is because whatever was happening there was so emotionally repressive and harmful and um, tragic or you felt so stuck that you had to leave to no longer feel suffocated and to be under that type of harm. And that type of harm that causes that type of celebration, liberation, it absolutely takes things away from you. Whether or not it's taking away your laughter or your peace or different parts of yourself that you had to learn how to compromise or minimize or water down to stay in that relationship, however long you stayed in that, that's the parts of you you got to heal. That's a part of you that you need to reclaim because otherwise what happens is you you get into new partnerships in case you're rushing into dating. You get into these partnerships and you are still a magnet for, or even at a magnet, you are more, you're still susceptible to being in relationships with people who, who fit the new shape that you're in, Right. We are all just puzzle pieces, right? And when you're in that type of relationship that I'm describing, it's almost like if you imagine that you're like a toy or something, like an inflatable toy, and you know, you've know you been deflated, like whether or not it's a corner of you has been deflated, like imagine yourself, you're like an inflatable ball and a side of that ball is now deflated and it's like all kilter. You're going to find somebody who goes and fits perfectly on top of that deflated corner of the ball, right? That their hand just like, just holds it just great, right? And you don't want that. You don't want someone who sees you a shell of yourself or a ghost of yourself or not fully embodying everything that you are and everything that you're supposed to be. And it's like, yeah, that's what I like. You know, you want to fully encapsulate and to grow into who you are or be on the journey to where you know what that feels like, right? You know what that feels like to start to speak your boundaries, to start to explore, to start to discover, right? You don't have to be perfect to be clear because there is no perfection. As long as you go through through this life, you're going to continue to be growing and evolving and changing. What you like today is not going to be the same seven years ago. Whether or not it's your favorite color, you know, maybe your favorite store, like you're going to continue to be evolving. So what you want is to have the skills that's needed to be fully and unapologetically you, 
And so that you match energies with someone who likes that you are fully and unapologetically you and supports that, right? Versus this deflated part of yourself. So allow yourself some time to heal and to recover those things. Um, the second thing for you to keep in mind when dating post-divorce is that there is no right time, but there is procrastination. Again, there is no right time, but there is procrastination. So this is probably one of the most common questions um, that I get or that I even hear some other folks in my community get about how do you know when is the right time to date post-divorce? And there isn't one. So I know I just said taking some time to heal, but taking time to heal is one thing and whatever that looks like for you to come to a place of where you feel some peace and where you feel some resolve. But what I see happens that, is that women reach that place of being feeling more healed or feeling some peace and some, revol- some resolve. And then they're like, okay, so I don't know when is the right time to date. Now, you know, the, when we procrastinate, we are putting off things that are unsavory to us, that they seem not pleasurable to us. That's the reason why we procrastinate. And so if you're at this place where you are fully more yourself and you're feeling more like, you know, you're peeking your head around the corner to kind of see well, what, what's going over here, what's going on over here in this dating, this dating thing, what are you over here talking about? And you're like, uh, I don't know if it's the right time. It's because you're scared, girl. It's because you're scared. And you are trying to find a reason why you you don't need to do it. And one of those one of those ways of doing it is to sound very, very, you know, smart and intentional by saying, Well, how do I know it's the right time? You gotta get out there. You gotta get out there and and try. You gotta get out there and see what you like and see what you don't like. You know, I was talking with one of my um one of my clients this this weekend and um the situation is different than this but i think the metaphor applies and talking about putting yourself out there and trying and uh i talked to her about how when you think about riding a bike if you don't know how to ride a bike you can go you can read all the manuals you can watch all the youtube gem- demonstrations you can even go to a live show and watch somebody else ride a bike but you are not going to know how to ride that bike until you get on it. And when you get on to riding that bike, you are going to wobble and you are going to fall. It is part of you learning how to ride a bike. You, you can't escape it. There's, there's no amount of preparation that's going to stop you from doing it. But it's worth it to feel, feel the air. You know, to to feel what it's like to find your balance, to find your groove, to upgrade to different kind of bikes, to take it to different places, to go to, you know, here in Houston, we have this one organization um, that does bike rides through the city, um, and but it's like for the culture. And so they'll like have like R&B night, and then they'll have old school night, and then they have like, um, you know, 90s hip hop night, you know, and it's just like, it's an, it's an experience. And then sometimes they'll stop at brunch places and sometimes they'll stop at, um, you know, do a bar hop or whatever. And it's at night sometimes, you know, it's just, it's an experience, right? Like you learning how to ride this bike has opened the door for even more experiences for you. And so that's what it is when it comes to when's the right time. I'm scared. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. You get, you need to learn. And even if you were someone who had like a, a short relationship or a short marriage, so you, you're not that far away from what dating is like in this current time period, you still are going to need to learn how to date in a different way. You're going to need to learn how to um, how to screen people better, to vet people better. You're going to need to learn how to show up with this new enlightened version of yourself um, you're going to need to know how to maybe pace your relationship. If you're someone who rushed into a relationship, you're going to learn how have to learn how to be with someone who is your equal or better if you're used to being in relationships with people that you take care of. You know, there's going to be a whole lot of learning that you need to do. But here's the thing about learning to if and staying with this bike metaphor. No one is judging you for getting on a bike and falling down or wobbling when you're just learning. Everybody knows, like, oh yeah. Yeah, it's okay. You got this. Like everybody's cheering you on because everybody has gone through it. 
It is normal for you to have skinned knees and for you to fall down and for you to be like, oh, I got this and then hit a rock and go off to the side. You know, like you learn from these experiences and everyone is is cheering for you. Right. They're cheering for you because you keep getting up and you and you keep your eyes forward and you're learning, you know, also what road you want to stay on. Like maybe part of the lesson that is that the reason you keep falling while riding this bike is because you keep picking these rocky ass roads when your your bike is not built for that. Right. Your bike is built for a smooth pavement pavement and maybe maybe a little bit of grass, maybe. Right. And so as you learning how to go into places, into situations that actually fit for you and not being like, well, why doesn't this work? And why does this feel so uncomfortable? Or, you know, or even for some of y'all, some of y'all are like, and this is where I kind of I'm going to mess up on the metaphor because I don't know that much about bikes. But, you know, you got a 10 speed mountain bike. So you're like pro, like you're ready for like good things. And so you're feeling not like it's okay to take a ride through the park and on pavement on this sidewalk, you know, go on loops for about, you know, two miles. But this bike is built for more, right? So you keep you keep dating people who are not on your level and wondering why you're so bored. You keep going to the safe spaces instead of putting yourself out there. Why? Because maybe you get to be in more control, right? Maybe it's because you get to um you know, determine what is, which path you're going to go, but you don't really want to be challenged. You, you know, you're prepared to be challenged. You know that you have the capability to be, but you don't know what's up ahead. So better to just stay in this nature preserve when part of your healing and part of what you need to learn how to do is get out of your comfort zone, stop dating these basic people. And I'm sure they're lovely people, but again, you know, cause they are a lovely paved sidewalk road in the nature preserve. But you are built for so much more. You deserve so much more, right? And so you learning to own that part of yourself. The third thing that I wrote down, oh, am I going to say this? Yeah, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. Um, Is to lean into your feminine energy. This might actually be combined with something else. So there might be six considerations, but we'll, we'll keep going. Lean into your feminine energy. Um, this can also mean leaning into your masculine energy. The reason why I was like, I don't know if I'm going to say that is just because I still, you know, some people are like cringe and they just want to roll over and they rather like scratch their eyes out than hear somebody talk about feminine energy versus masculine energy. But I, if you listen to this podcast, you know that I really love these terms because at the core, the way that I interpret them is that they are basically just talking about learning how to rest or actually show up for yourself. Some of you need to learn how to lean into your masculine energy because maybe, especially in love addictive relationships, you allow somebody else to have all the power and you um, have not learned how to take care of yourself, to own your thoughts and own your feelings, to make a decision for yourself. Um, You have just kind of um, abandoned those things or not develop them for the sake of relationship. Like it has been so much easier for you to kind of go into these experiences without, with being needless, wantless, thoughtless, um, as long as you were that person's partner and you have been in relationships with folks who have taken advantage of that. And so now you need to learn how to, to think for yourself and to not need someone to screen your thoughts and feelings for you and for you to stand in it. And for some of you, need to learn to learn some of you need to learn how to lean into your feminine energy. So stop trying to control everything, letting people help you, learning how to rest, learning how to not move so fast and nobody can catch you. Like you both of these um ex- both of these sides of the spectrum have real lessons that I think we all need to learn and depending on how things have shown up for you, you can pick which one that is. And for me, I use these terms because I feel like they fully encapsulate them under these terms versus, you know, having to combine a million different things to make up what seems so clear to me there in in the list of those qualities and things. So um, if you have not looked into wounded feminine energy and wounded masculine energy and wounded uh, and healthy feminine energy and healthy masculine energy, or you have, and the way that people talk about it just really turns you off, or you have a whole lot of think pieces 
<laughs> oh my, this is so destructive. I would I would still encourage you to step away from all the noise and just go on Pinterest. Just go on Pinterest and find a nice little little comparison chart and just look at the skills that are within each of those and just look at it look at it as a skill based um exercise to say, okay, which where would I line up? Where would I line up in my own personal balance? And then whatever you need to take from that, take it, you know, scratch out the name at the top. And use that as your own path of personal development and and lean into that. The fourth consideration for dating post-divorce is that you will find someone who will treat you the way you think you deserve to be treated. I'll say that again. You're going to find someone who treats you the way that you think you deserve to be treated or you're going to make it happen yourself. So if there is a part of you that does not like yourself, that neglects yourself, that does not know how to ask for help, you are going to find someone who is going to give you what you're asking for versus magically coming in to save that. And if you do, if you are someone who meets someone who does come in as a knight or nice nitrous in shining armor to give you this type of really amazing love, you are still going to have to do the internal work to learn how to receive it. So many of us have this amazing dream of someone seeing us and loving us and wanting us and cherishing us. And when that happens, that shit is scary. It is so scary for someone to see you at your most vulnerable. Y'all have heard me talk about this. To see you at your most vulnerable and um, to see you fully exposed and for you to learn how to stop flinching. For you have to for you to learn how to when these good things happen to you, for you to say, Yeah, of course good things happen to me. Of course I'm being loved. I deserve to be loved. Like those things don't go away just because you meet an amazing person. You are still your most important relationship. There's not gonna be any relationship that really saved you from having to do that work. You're gonna have amazing relationships that are the hands and feet of God in your life. You're going to have some amazing relationships that are angels here on earth for you. You're going to have so many relationships that heal parts of yourself that you never knew needed to be healed. And you are going to be an active part of that as well. You bring yourself wherever you go and you bring your openness and your receptivity along with your insecurities and your thoughts with you wherever you go. So you know, that's the good, good, the most positive scenario, right? Um, in dating post-divorce is that we fall into or we find or we attract or we manifest, you know, whatever word, word, whatever word feels best for you. We find this relationship that is just magical for us. And for some of us, we find relationships that are not so magical. And it's like, oh my, why does this keep happening? Or this is why I don't even want to date in the first place and all that other stuff. And if that's the case, you need to look at yourself and look at what are you what are you positioned for? Are you able to receive what you're asking for? If you're someone who's like, I really want to find someone who's loving and giving and kind and patient, are you loving, giving, kind and patient? Are you able to take a compliment, right? You know, and because this isn't about you trying to change your personality, like maybe it is a yin and yang type of thing where y'all kind of balance each other out. You know, one person is more pessimistic and one person is more optimistic. And that's not a deal breaker for the type of relationship that you have. But again, if you are if you are the one who's a little bit on the negative side. Can you, but you want to attract a partner or be in a partnership with someone who loves to be very verbal and like um, very affirmative and like that's the way to learn how to give love. You're going to have to learn how to take that type of love because if this person has boundaries and if this person is clued in with what they want, they are going to really need to be able to express themselves. And so how can they express themselves in a relationship with someone who's constantly shutting them down? And so. Part of your process is going to be learning, okay, what, again, what are the things that are me and what is somebody else? Uh, Why are these patterns happening? Is this something for me to look at internally or is there a red flag that I'm missing? For those of you who do not know 
I have a course that's all about this. Like literally every single point that I'm telling you, there is, if not one lesson, there are multiple lessons that talk about deconstructing all this. And the name of the program is Dating for Love Addicts, Dating 101 for Love Addicts. And um, I completely talk about creating a dating plan, learning how to discern what your patterns are, finding what you want, um, finding whether or not you're reciprocal for the things that you want. And so you can get that, get started immediately. Immediately, you have lifetime access and you can go to blackgirlsheal.org slash dating to join. And um, you know what? I will throw in a coupon since I'm here. So you can put in the coupon code transition to get $50 off that enrollment. So, or payment plans. There's both painful or payment plans. So that is for you. Blackgirlsheal.org slash dating. Okay, so that was number four. Let's talk about the fifth consideration for dating post-divorce. The fifth consideration is you get to have what you want. Again, you get to have what you want. Um, Something that I hear often is some folks who feel like because of the baggage that they, baggage that comes with divorce, that they feel like comes with divorce, that makes you ineligible for having what you want, whether or not it's someone that you are attracted to of a certain age, of a certain stature, of a certain child status, of a certain whatever right? Um, They almost come into this thinking like preparing to settle. And when you come in preparing to settle, you are going to settle. You're not going to be magically surprised because, oh, I thought I was going to, you know, get um, a frog, but I ended up getting Prince Charming. No, because you positioned yourself to take scraps metaphorically, when you've always been a queen, you've always been deserving of the best. Just because you life circumstances happened that caused this disruption has never taken away from your value. You know, one of the earliest earliest myths about divorce that I didn't realize was being consistently busted until much later on is I always had in my head that the only people who got divorced were older. So like late 30s, 40s, maybe 50s. But so many people, so many people have been through divorces in their early 20s, right? And because they, they learned or they maybe connected to someone who was a high school sweetheart or, you know, they felt forced into this or whatever it may be. And so, again, this is so common. And whether, and this is not me saying that it's good or bad, I'm saying that you would be surprised how many people, especially the older you get, how many people have grace for for this. They have understanding for this. They have openness for this, that they don't see this as a sign of failure. And honestly, if they are that type of person that's like, well, yuck, you have been through a divorce, I don't want you, then you're probably not going to align in a lot of other areas too. Because that probably means that your your mindset and your values in some ways don't align don't align, and that's okay. That does not mean that they are a bad person. It just means that y'all were not meant to to be. So when you're looking at dating post divorce, you're looking for people who are kind and compassionate and understanding, and you get to decide if a person's response to your path your past aligns with that or if it doesn't. But and the main point of this is you get to have what you want, especially if you have gotten the opportunity to do a do-over, you get to decide what what works for you and what doesn't. Um, I'm going to skip and say what I wrote for number seven, for number six, because I feel like it goes along with this, which is don't be in a rush. Learn from your lessons, which are the relationships that you may get in post-divorce and learn how to take your time. And this is across the board. This is even for people who um, tend to go slower into relationships or be more cautious. And then, of course, those who may tend towards more love addictive habits and, you know, 
fall very quickly and want to overattach very quickly without doing um, adequate assessing and vetting. And I think sometimes, this is not everybody, but this is probably a select few of you, where you, part of the energy around dating again is maybe proving to yourself, especially if you're a perfectionist, that you are going to get it right this time. Or if you're trying to avoid the emotional stress and anxiety that happens when when it comes to dating just in general, um, you are in a rush to find your person so you don't have to deal with this anymore. So you can just be done, right? You got other things that you want to do and you're ready to mark this off of your list. And I want to encourage you to not be in a rush and to take your time and to learn from every relationship that you have. So, you know, for me, I can say because I had so much shame around getting a divorce and what that meant for me at first, I very much was in a rush to find my person. I was in a rush to reclaim time that I felt like I had lost by being in a relationship that was not right for me. I was in a rush to live up to the standard of perfection that I felt that I had in my head for what I'm supposed to show up as, um, especially in the work that I do. Um, I had a rush to what I just said about wanting to just rest and relax and not have to worry about this. (laughs) And that did not set me up for success. And it didn't set me up for success in that I attached to negative people, but that it didn't allow me to really look at myself for a little bit. And it wasn't until I started to actually look at myself and work on what had brought me to that point that I actually started to see things change in my life socially around me. You know, all of that rushing towards a relationship that that self-medication, right? That self-soothing, that distraction did not save me from myself and save me from my own inner healing. So doing that work is what helped. And so as a result, every relationship that I've had, every dating partnership or real, real partnership that I've had since then, every single one of these men have given me such a gift. I have learned so much from each of them and I can think of them all very fondly. And I feel very fortunate for that. And I feel grateful for how each one has helped me grow in so many different ways. And how I've said already here before in this podcast that every time I partner with someone, it gets better. And and I love that because with each partnership, I learn so much more about who I am and what I want and what I don't want. So it makes all the riffraff that I used to very easily get through and I would just so easily make accommodations and justifications for and just give them the benefit of the doubt and try to be patient or really focus on, well, they're not going to disrespect me and I'm going to share my boundaries. Like, I don't need to share boundaries with anyone who is not showing up the way that I need them to. Like, they they can go and find someone else who's the right fit for them and I will save this emotional energy and openness and compassion for someone who comes more ready, right? And so um, allow yourself to learn as you go through this process. You're going to be learning things that you did not know you didn't know, and that's okay. Um, And this is even for those of you who um, do exit a long-term relationship and maybe your next relationship or one very soon after that does end up being your next long-term partner, you're still going to need to learn things. And so I'm really encouraging you to not see, not deify your partner and make them your God. They are not the answer to your prayers. You are. You are how you show up for yourself, how you love yourself, how you protect yourself, how you um, allow yourself to receive your relationship with your high power, like all those things, that is the answer. And all of your relationships are just an outpouring of that. They're just a reflection of that. So remember that. Um, Because when you make somebody your God, um, you're going to be disappointed every time, no matter how wonderful they are because they're human and that's not what they're here for. Um, The last thing I'll share about dating post-divorce, the last consideration or thing to keep in mind, and this is more of a validation, uh, maybe, mm, no, I think I'm going to say this as a tip, is 
single parenting while dating is something for you to make an active plan for. So, um, and making an active plan as far as what are your standards, where is your village, who are you going to use, um, and getting that set up. So if you are fortunate enough to have family members, grandparents, other people who are available, talking with them about their availability um, so that you can be sure about what are your dating nights and what are not. It will be very frustrating if you have a family member who like you're just used to dropping them off. But as you start dating and building a life, they start to get sick of it. They start to kind of feel overwhelmed or burnt out or maybe taken advantage of. And then they start telling you no. Right. So come up with a plan ahead of time and coordinate with people with what they are available for so that you can create your dating plan around it. Um, I would also really encourage you to only date people who are considerate of your dating schedule as a single parent or are ready to make accommodations for it. So obviously, not anyone who would judge you. But, um, you know, a lot of times you may end up dating a fellow single parent. So unless that person has the same schedule as you with their children or is willing to make accommodations for it, I, I'm i just going to tell you all straight out, I would, I would not waste my time because that that is very, very frustrating and it's hard and you do not want to express any frustration um, inadvertently towards, you know, other people or towards your kids or anything, because hopefully you love being with your kids and you love the life that you have and you want to have a social life on the other side. So again, this is about finding people who your lifestyles match together, right? It shouldn't be hard, especially at the beginning, right? This should, this should just flow together. Let's unlearn that dating and relationships have to have some type of strife or struggle to get through. Let's let it be kismet. Let's let it be something that just flows, okay? That's what I want for y'all. Ease and flow in this stage of your life. So those are the seven considerations. That was a lot, y'all, but I got them in. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it. Now, for those of you who follow me on social media or you listen to this podcast on YouTube, be sure to comment if you have any follow-up questions uh, that, about this topic that you would like to maybe be a part two or for me to talk about in the future. And if you feel like this gave you what you needed, please also let me know that as well. For those of you who are dating and even those of you who are not divorced, but you're wanting to date and learn how to have these types of boundaries and to learn what you need and to date more successfully. The Dating One-on-One for Love Addicts course is for you. It is also for my love avoidance because we talk about you not pushing people away um, and letting people in. You can go to blackgirlsheal.org slash dating coupon code transition for $50 off. All right. I love you all so much. I will see you in the next episode. Thank you all for everything. Thank you for your support and love throughout the years. I'm so grateful for y'all. I'm grateful for this platform. I'm grateful that I get to um, be one of the voices in your healing journey. And um, I take it as an honor and I don't take it for granted. So sending you all love and take care of yourselves.